for the day. And we're going to pick up where we left off. So I want to repeat some things because sometimes at the end of the hour I sort of rush through things. And so it's always good to go over that, put things in context. When we left last time, we were really talking about suitable carbon sources for, for non-photosynthetic organisms. Photosynthetic microbes we'll talk about a little bit later <coughs> in the course. And a suitable carbon source for photosynthetic microorganisms is simply CO2. Uh, but they generate their energy via photosynthesis, not necessarily through uh, the oxidation of carbon. So let's sort of put our skeleton of the catabolic pathway <coughs> on, on the, the board and sort of look at what constitutes a suitable carbon source with a big emphasis on oxaloacetate, which is the beginning and end of the Krebs cycle. Now, oxaloacetate has four carbons in it. And we've really been focusing thus far really on degrading our carbon sources, oxidizing them to generate energy. And the second third of the course really talks more about assimilatory properties, uh, how cells take carbon sources and then uh, uh, do uh, biosynthesis so they can divide. But we really have to take a little break and sort of go into uh, assimilation a little bit right now, and that really has to do with this very important molecule of phalloacetate. So we have it in our catabolic processes, but it is also extremely important for anabolic processes. You will see that of all of the molecules we talk about throughout this entire course, in terms of physiology, oxaloacetate is at the most is the most uh, utilized and therefore at the most premium inside an inside any cell. <coughs> oxaloacetate is needed to build a particular amino acid, which we'll talk about later, called aspartic acid. Aspartic acid is an amino acid found in protein. Aspartic acid is then used to make five other amino acids, again, all found in proteins. And as we know, proteins are a major component of the uh, cell. And aspartic acid is also used to build all pyrimidine nucleotides. So half of the nucleic acid content has to come from aspartic acid, and aspartic acid comes from oxaloacetate, which is also required for metabolism. And oxaloacetate also participates in a process called gluconeogenesis. And again, we will cover all of these processes in the second third of the course. So you know, knowing all of these names really at this point is not so critical. This is more for illustration to demonstrate that exaloacetate is an extremely important molecule. Okay? You not only need it for catabolism, you need it for all of these other anabolic processes that I've written on the board. So let's talk about <coughs> suitable carbon sources. We have glycolysis. We start with carbons. That goes into a three-carbon stage. We have 
pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. CoA has two carbons from our carbon source. Then we enter the Krebs cycle. We have a six carbon stage in the Krebs cycle, a five carbon stage in the Krebs cycle, a four carbon stage in the Krebs cycle, and we're losing CO2 along the way. So <clears throat> if a cell is growing on a six or three carbon carbon source, does all of those carbons go into the tricarboxylic acid cycle? How is it going to get oxaloacetate for all of these other properties? It can't, right? So you actually have reactions where you take three carbon molecules and we'll talk about them later. And we convert them into oxaloacetate. Okay? And we will go, uh, we will do those reactions ad nauseum in the second third of the course. This is just for illustration. So if you're living on a six carbon source or a three carbon uh, source, anything that gets converted into a pathway in glycolysis, you can generate energy and you can make oxaloacetate. Some of your carbon will go into the uh, tricarboxylic acid cycle. Some of it won't. Some of it will be converted into oxaloacetate for anabolic purposes. All right? So you're fine living on a three carbon or a six carbon carbon source. If you're living on a five carbon carbon source, are you also fine? Five carbon carbon sources would enter here. Are you fine? Can you generate energy? That's the first question. Sure. You've got all of this, all of these stages in TCA that you can oxidize your carbon source with and generate energy. What about your oxaloacetate? <coughs> do you need oxaloacetate? If you're starting with a five carbon carbon source, do you need oxaloacetate at the beginning of the Krebs cycle? No. no, you're not running it. So you're coming in as a five carbon carbon source. You go through what remains of the Krebs cycle, and what do you get? Oxaloacetate. What can that oxaloacetate can go into then anabolic processes? Similarly, if you're working with a four carbon carbon source, <coughs> it's converted to succinate. Succinate can enter the Krebs cycle. Is that organism okay? Well, is it generating energy? Sure, it can convert the succinate into oxaloacetate and do some oxidation stages, generate some energy. And for a four carbon carbon source entering here, do you need oxaloacetate for the beginning of the Krebs cycle? No, because you're really not running it, okay? So you've got excess oxaloacetate. So that is fine. Now what is now a problem is a two carbon. So we're talking about non-photosynthetic organisms. What happens if you try to, to, to live with a two-carbon carbon source? Well, you're going to enter here at acetyl-CoA. You're going to use an oxaloacetate to run the Krebs cycle. You run the Krebs cycle. You get your oxaloacetate back. Can you build things with it? What would happen if I take that oxaloacetate out of the cycle and build things with it? Do I have ways of regenerating oxaloacetate from a three carbon carbon source? This organism's in trouble. Okay? So, in microorganisms, there's something called the, you know, TCA bypass cycle. also known as the glyoxylate cycle. And it's one of my favorite cycles. Okay? The, the glyoxylate cycle allows, it allows organisms to 
to live with a two carbon carbon source or <coughs> large macromolecules that are converted into a single color. And these large macromolecules really are fatty acids. Fatty acids get converted into <coughs> acetyl-CoA. Okay? So we're going to be talking about two carbon-carbon sources. I have this up here because some of the reactions that we're going to be talking about are taken from the Krebs cycle, and some of them are unique. All right? And this is going to allow our organism to live on a two-carbon-carbon carbon source. And what, this, what these bypass cycles do is allow you to use oxaloacetate for catabolism. But when you finish the cycle, you end up with two oxaloacetate molecules. All right? So when the glyoxylate cycle ends with two molecules of oxaloacetate. Okay? So the organism regenerates one molecule of oxaloacetate, which it started the process of, but it ends with two. And that other oxaloacetate can then go and fuel anabolic processes. All right? So Nature is fond of redundancy, and if it can use reactions found in other pathways, it will. So this was our summary from last time of the Krebs cycle. I will be drawing the bypass or glyoxylate cycle. I will continue the summary on this particular paper. So if you have it from last lecture, you're going to want to get it out. And if we're living on a two-carbon-carbon carbon source, and we're going to be successful, and we are going to end up with two molecules of oxaloacetate at the end, what stages in the Krebs cycle do we want to skip? What do we want to bypass? Remember, we have to both metabolize our carbon, oxidize it, but we must also assimilate carbon. So what stages in the Krebs cycle are bypassed? What? Anything that produces carbon dioxide, which is a gas and can just float off into the environment. So in the glyoxylate cycle, all reactions that generate CO2 in the TCA cycle are bypassed. Do not lose any carbon. And the two carbon carbon source that we'll be talking about because it's the one that we find a lot in the environment is acetate. And remember, when we're dealing with alternate carbon sources, what cells do is take the alternate carbon source and then they want to convert it to something that is found in this sort of core, in this core catabolic uh, uh, pathway. Okay? So if I have acetate as my carbon source, the cell is going to want to convert it into what? Acetyl-CoA, right? So we're going to <coughs> convert our acetate into acetyl-CoA, 
And to run the glyoxylate cycle, we need two molecules of acetyl-CoA, so I'm going to make them both at the same time. S-CoA, and I'm going to get two molecules of acetyl-CoA. I just sort of drew the chemistry on the board, not the biochemistry on the board. What type of bonds do I have here? A bioester, and bioesters are High energy. High energy. So what is missing from the reaction? I need an energy source, right? I'm going from a low energy molecule to a molecule that has a high energy bond, ATP, right? So we'll have two ATPs being hydrolyzed because we are actually forming a high energy bond. All right? So we've got our uh, acetyl-CoA, and we're going to take one of those molecules, one acetyl-CoA, and with that, we are going to start running the Krebs cycle. Okay? We're going to start running the Krebs cycle. And we are going to run it to what point? So at what, so that right now the glyoxylate and the Krebs cycle is going to look very similar. Up to what point? Where will I start my bypass? Okay, so where am I going to start my bypass? Where do I lose my first CO2? To uh, uh, the alpha ketoglutarate. So what I'm going to lack is my isocitrate dehydrogenase, right? So that forms our, oxalo our oxalosubstanate, and then oxalosubstanate, we have the spontaneous decarboxylation. So we can't form oxalosubstanate. So we're really going up to the point of isocitrate, all right? We're not going to have isocitrate dehydrogenase because if we do, we're ultimately going to lose the CO2 with the de uh, spontaneous decarboxylation of oxaloacetate. So we're going to go acetyl-CoA plus oxaloacetate, and I'm not going to draw all of the reactions out like we did when we did the Krebs cycle, because they're identical. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is, I'm going to end up with citric acid. I am taking a four carbon molecule and a two carbon molecule. I am joining them together to get a six carbon molecule and the enzyme is a synthase. Why is it not a synthetase? No, There's no ATP involved. So we're going to call it citrate synthase. But was an energy source involved? Might not have been ATP, but was energy source involved. We're doing work. We're forming a bond between two molecules, right? Performing work requires energy. Where's, what's fueling this? Hydrolysis. The bioester. The hydrolysis of the bioester. And then we're going to go and turn our citric acid into uh, aconitate. And then the aconitate will be converted into isocitrate, and all of this is catalyzed by the enzyme aconitase. Okay? So, we're looking very similar to the Krebs cycle. Now, we have to bypass the Krebs cycle. One of these I soaked with water. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to use that one. And so we're really going to start, we're not starting the glyoxylate cycle here, but we're going to start with the 
the novel reaction of the glyoxylate cycle with isocitrate. And let's draw an isocitrate on the board. Really, we're getting our bypass reaction. And we are actually going to split isocitrate, okay, into two, but we're not going to liberate CO2. When we oxidized isocitrate and got our oxaloseptinate, we liberated CO2. But here we're going to split the molecule, but we cannot generate a gas. We cannot lose any carbon, and this molecule is going to be split into two molecules. One of them is succinate, and the other molecule is this guy here. A two carbon molecule, and what type of molecule would we describe this as? It's an alpha keto acid. And it is called dioxalate. That's where the cycle gets its name. Okay? And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is. Isocitrate lyase. We can talk about uh, inhibitors of isocitrate lyase uh, later if you want. But now we have our succinate and our glyoxylate. Well, where do we see succinate? in the Krebs cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to go from our isocitrate, and we're going via isocitrate lyase. We're going to generate succinate and glyoxylate. <coughs> succinate and glyoxylate. Now, so we have succinate. What can succinate do? It can go on and generate energy in the Krebs cycle. And it will give us, at the end, how many oxaloacetates from the succinate? One. Just from the succinate, we're going to get one. But I told you earlier, the glyoxylate cycle will end up producing two oxaloacetates, okay? One to be used for anabolism. Well, we've got a two-carbon molecule, glyoxylate, and that's going to somehow have to end up in oxaloacetate. So what else do I need? Another two-carbon molecule. Now, when I started this, I made it a point to use how many acetates? Two. So what do you think that other molecule is going to be? Acetyl-CoA. All right? It's going to be acetyl-CoA. So if I take my glyoxylate and then have, you know, have a reaction with another acetyl-CoA, I can get a four carbon molecule. All right? Now, <clears throat> I want you to think the next reaction is mechanistically going to be very similar to a reaction that we've already done. 
All right? Now, I pointed out that this was an alpha keto acid, and we have acetyl CoA with its high energy thio ester. What other reaction in the Krebs cycle has used an alpha keto acid and acetyl CoA and taken advantage of that high energy thio ester? The trick synthase, right? Oxaloacetate is a alpha keto acid. So the next reaction, which is malate, catalyzed by malate synthase, <laughs> resembles citrate synthase. an alpha keto acid interacting with acetyl CoA. And the thio ester provides the energy. <coughs> and the bond we're going to form is the same. It's going to be off of our alpha carbon. And we are going to get
he starts with two acetates, converting them to acetyl CoA, which will require energy. All right. Are there any questions on this? All right. We will then move on to fatty acids and how microorganisms use fatty acids as carbon sources. And if the microorganism is only using fatty acid as its only carbon source that you're providing it, to live that organism must also be able to run the glyoxylate cycle. As fatty acids get converted into acetyl CoA. So, we're going to start with a fatty acid. And I'm going to do a six chain fatty acid. One, two, three, four, five. Six chain fatty acid, because we're going to have a little fun and sort of answer a question about ourselves by the end of the course. It's not a pretty question, but we'll answer it anyway. And so I'm going to use a six-chain fatty acid because six chains, six carbons and glucose. We'll make a direct comparison between a six-chain fatty acid and the amount of energy that can be produced and from uh, glycolysis and the press side. All right, so <clears throat> I am going to convert this into acetyl-CoA. So at the end of all of this, how many acetyl-CoA's will I produce? How many carbons and acetyl-CoA from our carbon source? Two. Mm -hmm. I have six in my fatty acid. So how many acetyl-CoA's do I have? Three. Three, okay. And so if I look at my fatty acid, and fatty acids are thus named because you have an acidic group and a long chain of carbons, otherwise known as acyl groups or fats. Um, hence, we have the name fatty acid. I'm going to convert this into three molecules of acetyl-CoA. And what portion is going to come off as acetyl-CoA first? I want to use some common sense here. So it doesn't seem like, oh God, I'm memorizing everything. Look, what part of this molecule now looks most like acetyl-CoA? The carboxylic acid. The carboxylic acid group, right? Remind us what acetyl-CoA looks like. All right. So what's the first thing I'm going to want to do? Put on, yeah, I mean, it's that easy. Put on a fetal, put on a coenzyme A, right? So I'm going to <coughs> have my coenzyme A, and I'm going to get an acyl CoA, CH3, CH2, or Like I did, 
didn't forget that. To write that in. If I call that acetyl-CoA synthetase, what am I going to call this? And remember that when you got a big chain of carbons, we call those acyl groups. How about acyl-CoA synthetase? And that's going to cost me an ATP. All right. Now that I have my acyl CoA, I need to remove an acetyl CoA. Now, nature is fond of redundancy and it likes to run the same reaction over and over and over again. So, yeah, I've got to take this these two carbons off as my acetyl-CoA. But what I'm left with, we want it to look a lot like what we started with. So what am I going to want to do to this carbon here? I'm going to want to oxidize it, right? I'm going to want to eventually have a ketone here, right? So my next molecule is going to look a lot like this molecule, but two carbons shorter, all right? So we're going to oxidize, and eventually we're going to have to stick on oxygen, but can we stick oxygen directly on a chain of carbon molecules linked with single bonds? No. What do we always do first? Uh, we, have to, we have to create the double bond, all right? So we'll do that now. Now, where in the Krebs cycle have we done a very similar reaction? When we went from succinate, right? You remember what succinate looked like? <coughs> Drawing this on the board to remind you what succinate looks like. And we know what oxaloacetate looks like. doing this to point out similarity, right? We added an oxygen, right? We have to oxidize to get oxaloacetate. And we first did what? We first oxidized our succinate, and that generated the molecule fumarate, and fumarate has what in it? A double bond. Does everybody see this? This is going to be mechanistically similar. All right? So we're going to take our six-chain fatty acid, S-CoA derivative, we are going to oxidize it, and we are going to create our double bond. something is oxidized, something must be reduced. reduced. When we oxidize succinate to form fumarate and created a double bond, did we use NAD? No. We used FAD. FAD. So what do you think you're going to use here? Also FAD. FAD. Nature is fond of... I say that over for two reasons. It's true, and this way I'm redundant by saying it. And I guess I yet again prove the point. That's a little semantic joke. <laughs> Seem to appreciate it. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to generate an FADA. And we're going to name this enzyme. And we're going to get over our fear of naming enzymes. First, what's the end of the enzyme going to sound like? Dehydrogenase. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> well, you know, tiny steps for little feet, you know? Ace. Okay, now what do I put in front of it? Okay, it's a dehydrogenase. And before when we named when we named all of our dehydrogenases, 
cases before, the first part of the enzyme name has always been what we dehydrogenated. And this would be acyl-CoA, CoA dehydrogenase. Okay? So even biochemists can be a little redundant. Thank goodness. All right. So now we're going to add our oxygen, which we can do by adding a water across the double bond. So I'm drawing each one of these out. CH2 O uh, no. water, and I'm going to end up with a hydroxyl group, a beta hydroxyl. The name of this enzyme is called enoyl CoA hydrogenase. Right. And now I have my beta hydroxyl group. And we can look at this and we can see are my electrons balanced? This carbon, what has happened to it? Oxidized or reduced? Oxidized. This carbon reduced. reduced. This carbon ended up oxidized. This carbon ended up reduced. Do I need a coenzyme? No, you never need a coenzyme when you're adding water across a double bond. One of the carbons is oxidized, the other carbon is already reduced. Okay, so I've got my beta hydroxy here. I want to now turn it into a Ketone, so I'm going to do what again? Oxidize. Oxidize. So we'll take my So, if something is oxidized, something must be reduced. reduced. That will be NAD to NADH. And we will name this enzyme. The end of it is going to be ACE. <laughs> and before the ACE, we're going to have a dehydrogenase. <laughs> Okay. And this is a beta hydroxy acyl CoA dehydrogenase. All right. A C Y L. Okay. Now we're at the point where we can start. take off an acetyl CoA. Alright? Because now if we take off an acetyl CoA, we've got that ketone in there, and we're going to have something that looks very much like what we started with, but minus two carbon. And by doing it this way, the cell doesn't have to evolve new sets of enzymes 
just because you're eliminating two carbons at a time. The active sites are always recognizing what's at the right uh, end of the molecule. So we're going to take our molecule here. going to take another CoA and we're going to end up with acetyl CoA. I always remember it as ACAP, acyl-CoA, acetyl-transferase, a cap. Transfer. I can't spell transfer. Transfer. My acetyl-CoA goes into the Krebs cycle. How many ATP equivalents can be produced from one molecule of acetyl-CoA entering the Krebs cycle? An even dozen. All right, so I'm going to get 12 ATP here from that acetyl-CoA. All right, now how many ATP did I get, or can I get, via oxidative phosphorylation by just converting my six-chain fatty acid into a four-chain and the acetyl-CoA? What substrates for oxidative phosphorylation have I generated? FADH and NADH. Right, and together FADH is going to give me how many ATPs? Two. Two. Again, this is all by oxidative phosphorylation. My NADH is going to give me plus 3 ATPs. And I have to start with the deficit. All right, because I had to use that ATP by acetyl CoA dissipate. All right, so right now, I have already generated. Twelve, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, sixteen. Twelve, three, two, and then minus one because I had to start with an ATP. All right, so right now I'm at sixteen ATP. And I'm not done with the process yet. All right. Notice I did not use an ATP here. The transferase does not need an ATP. The transferase is using the energy by breaking this box. I don't need an ATP. I have an energy source. So whenever you're starting with a fatty acid, it's only one ATP. And that's the first time you add the CoA to the fatty acid. After that, you're done using ATPs to go further. So. If I were to do another round of this with our four chain fatty acid, I'm going to end up with how many acetyl CoA? Two, right? So another round is going to give me two acetyl CoA. Now, in doing that, how many FADs and how many NADHs am I going to generate? <laughs> one of each, right? Just one, because I've got four carbons here. Here I've got two carbons, right? I only have to do it once, right? So I'm going to have an FAD going to an FADH. I've got an 
NAD going to the NADH. That's going to be two ATP. three ATPs, and I end up with two acetyl-CoA's. Each acetyl-CoA is 12 ATPs. And if we add that all up, I've got 16, and 24 is 40, to 45. Got 45 ATP from a 6 chain fatty acid. And the molecular weight of a fatty acid, I think, is around 116. Dalton? All right. Let's compare that to glucose. If I take glucose, start with glycolysis. It's all of my glucose goes through a glycolysis, gets converted into acetyl-CoA, and then that acetyl-CoA goes through the Krebs cycle. How many ATPs do I get from all of that per molecule of glucose? 38 ATPs. And glucose, I think, has a molecular mass of around 180. Yes? Normally, is the acyl-CoA a synthetase one? One. When you take your initial fatty acid and you add the S-CoA. And remember, six-chain fatty acids don't really exist in nature. Sixteen-chain fatty acids do. But I didn't really want to do 16 on the board. I thought that was a little too redundant, mm -hmm. OK? But uh, the most common uh, fatty acid is 16-chain 16, 16 fatty acid. All right, so I've got 45 ATP per 16 uh, for a molecule that has a molecular mass of 116. And for glucose, I have 38 ATP for a molecule that has a molecular mass of 180. OK, the question about our cell. Why do we get that? When you have excess carbon, how do we store it? Fat. And why do we store it in fat? You can store more energy in fat yeah. than you can in glucose in a sugar. So a little unfortunate truth about our cells. And this is sort of an interesting thing, you know. Was obesity or, or people being overweight a problem a thousand years ago? No. People were pretty scrawny then. They didn't live too long. Life was rough. There were the assailing vandals, the Vikings coming to kill you, the Magyars coming from Eastern Europe, the Huns, <laughs> smallpox. You name it, <laughs> you had it. You know, people only lived to be about, you know, what was old a thousand years ago? Four years. Forty. I would be considered ancient <laughs> at 55. Well, yeah, a thousand years ago, 55, I would have been way at that one end of the bell curve. Um, I probably wouldn't have any teeth, thank God, for dentistry. <laughs> But this is sort of an example of, you know, like, why do we store our things as fat? Because we now know that, you know, fat isn't good for us, right? And we have LA Fitness and little fat so here lost 30 pounds this last year by swimming a mile a day at the LA Fitness. And I go to the LA Fitness up in Oro Valley because I'm the youngest one there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm the only one in their 50. Everybody else is in their 70s. And I feel like, like, you know, Michael Phelps, <laughs> and, uh, and I believe me, I'm not swimming that fast. <laughs> no, but you know, we now know that it's not good to be overweight, but this is sort of an example of where our brains overtook our evolution, right? We domesticated animals. We domesticated farming. And in many ways, we became a species that could produce food of plenty. And guess what? It kind of catches up with us. 
you know, in a bad way, right? But if you look at how we really evolved, and, you know, 1,000 years is nothing on the evolutionary time scale, you know, yeah, anytime you had an extra carbon, store it as fast because you will get more energy from it, okay? Is there any questions about um, fatty acid oxidation? Could yes. you more time explain the difference between synthesis and synthesis? Okay, I could. Uh, when both of those reactions are going to require energy, all right? If the energy source is the hydrolysis of ATP, we call it a synthetase. All right? So here, I don't think I have, ah, I do. We form the reaction, we form the high energy bond, we use ATP to do it, it's a synthetase. If ATP is not involved, we call it a synthase. But the one thing I want to emphasize is just because AT is, ATP is not involved doesn't mean that that reaction didn't require energy. Citrate synthase, malate synthase, both require energy, but our energy source there is the thioester. Okay? So if it doesn't involve ATP or GTP or any nucleotide triphosphate, we're going to call it synthase. If it does, we're going to call it synthase. All right? Yes? Is there a name for this hot one? Oh, yeah. Um, fatty acid oxidation or uh, beta. I'm having a senior moment. Uh, <laughs> beta oxidation, yeah, yeah. Or fatty acid oxidation. Okay. And microbes do it, humans do it. It's pretty uh, universal. All right? Yes. Um, since this is breaking into two carbon acetyl coas, what would happen if you started with a fatty acid that had an odd number of carbons? Right. That's a very interesting question because I, I, I wonder about this every year and I even try to track it down. If you ended up, started with an odd chain fatty acid, at the end you're going to have a three carbon molecule, right? And that would stop the reaction and you would have a three carbon molecule that you could possibly assimilate. So the question is, could an organism live with an odd fatty acid as its only carbon source? And the answer, I've never found the answer to that, okay? Now, let's look at it in terms of nature. And it could, may not, odd fatty, fatty acids are rare in nature, okay? Most fatty acids, all of the fatty acids are almost 99 of the fatty acids that you find in membranes are DNA, and they're 16. Mm -hmm. All right? So in a real-life scenario where a microbe could find itself living on fatty acids as a sole carbon source, it's all going to be even. Mm -hmm. With an occasional odd chain fatty acid, you know, maybe at 1%. So, so uh, I don't think they could live. I don't think you'd ever find a situation where the only carbon source is the odd chain fatty acid, which is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I always wonder that every year. And I tr actually, even this morning, I was seeing if I could find something. No one's ever done that experiment. Yeah. Um, how come when you, when you do another go around of the reaction, you don't produce two NADHs and two FADHs? Ah, okay. So Let's, uh, all right. I'll show you why in a minute. Why don't we do it, okay? Why don't we continue with our four carbon guide? We've got a few minutes, and this, this, this is often a point of confusion. So we finished with our <coughs> and I'm going to sort of do it in a skeleton form, and then we draw out all of the, the bonds. So, all right, so we're going to start with that, and we're going to oxidize, and that's going to generate our ene oil.
people use our dehydratase, our hydratase, excuse me. We'll then use our other dehydrogenase. generate our NADH and now we're going to use our transferase we have S-CoA coming in and how many acetyl-CoA's do I produce? Two. Do you see why you only need one more? Because I'm going to end up with this yeah, it's one of these things where when people see it, they go, oh, yeah, of course. And another C double bond. That's so All right, don't worry, I'm not going to say, given a 12 chain fatty acid, how many ATPs did you produce? Because that would be sort of a useless exercise. Uh, the important thing is to just know what one round looks like. Know that you have to start it with ATP to make your S-CoA, and know that fats can store more energy. And why can fats store more energy? Why can you get more energy out of a fat? Down, down, up, down. molecule can you oxidize more? The fat. The fat. Yeah. You look at these two molecules and you just sort of look at the sort of an overall oxidation state. Which molecule is more reduced? No, oh, the fatty acid. You generate energy by oxidation. A more reduced molecule can be oxidized more, therefore it stores more energy. All right? That's why you get 45 and 38, which is a much more reduced molecule. Okay? All right, so we're going to start oxidating. Are there any more questions on uh, beta oxidation? Otherwise known as fatty acid oxidation. All right, so we are going to start talking about what happens to our NADHs and our FADHs. I've been talking all the way through the course that we generated an NADH, and that that was three ATP. And we're going to talk a little bit about how those NADHs, how the energy stored in NADH and FADH can be converted into ATP. After that, we'll talk about fermentation, and then we'll start the problem set. So I guess we could even be starting the problem set, maybe one or two, as early as Thursday, but definitely by next Tuesday. So we're a little bit ahead of the schedule. And um, so if you haven't started the problem set, you really should do it now. Okay. We're talking about oxidative phosphorylation. And when you're talking about oxidative phosphorylation, we are really going to be talking about a series of energy couplings, okay? So whenever you're talking about energy, reactions really happen in pairs. A negative delta G reaction is coupled to a positive delta G reaction. And so we're going to have our uh, 
negative delta G coupled with a positive delta G reaction or process. So we're going to start way at the very beginning before we even get to oxidative phosphorylation, which we'll start next time. So I just want to review some energy here, energy use. Oxidation of carbon. Delta G is less than zero. So whenever we've oxidized carbon in metabolism, something must be reduced. Right? And that molecule was NAD or FAD going to NADH or FAD going to FADH. These reactions have a positive delta G. Reduced molecules have more energy than oxidized molecules. Hence, you can get more energy out of catabolizing a fat than you can glucose. Fats are more reduced compared to glucose. All right? So that's our first energy coupling. The energy released from the oxidation gives us a reduced form of our coenzyme. Now, if going from NAD plus to NADH is going to take energy, what about the back reaction? When we start with the reduced forms of these molecules and we go to the oxidized forms, is that going to have a positive or negative delta G? It's going to have a negative delta G. And what does that energy couple do? Listen to the of ATP. Is it a direct coupling to ATP? Probably not. A lot of energy is being re uh, released there, and potential energy is more effectively does work if it's released in usable increments. Right? Going directly from this and saying, I'm taking this energy and I'm going to directly take that energy release and build an ATP molecule, it's not going to happen. Or you could maybe evolve some way for that to happen, but that organism went to state because you wouldn't be able to do it. Too much energy release. So, This energy is released and where do those electrons go? going to be coupled to building a proton motive force the electrons from NADH are not directly trans not directly donated to oxygen same is true with FADH going to FAD we go through the electron you've all heard of the electron transport system Right? Where your electrons go rolling. You can look it up on YouTube or something like that. Alright? And all of these reactions, these are all sort of 
the reductions and redox reactions are all going to liberate energy as a process, and we're going to build a proton motive source, which is a hydrogen plus gradient across the membrane. zoom in on our, <coughs> no, we're not going to zoom in. Be gone. <laughs> we'll start here on Thursday. <laughs>